You're listening to the Redeemer Church Podcast. To learn more about Redeemer Church, including our gathering times in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida, visit us online at RedeemerPV.com. Today's sermon comes from Pastor Sean Yost. Uh, We're doing a series this summer called Summer in the Psalms. And the Psalms are deep theology wrapped in beautiful poetry. And we're looking at what these psalms can teach us. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, Psalm 63 and what we can learn about prayer. Our church mission statement is to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel so they may become fully devoted followers of Jesus. We, we talk about this frequently, that there's a lot of good messages, there's good motivational speakers, there's good do-it-yourself messages out there and TED Talks and all these things, but there's only one message that can take somebody from death to life And that's the message of the gospel. That's what we're called to be as the body of Christ, as the church. We're called to reach people with that message so that they can become fully devoted followers of Jesus. What does that mean? What is a fully devoted follower? In Growth Track, we spend time really defining what we mean by fully devoted because it could mean something different to each of us. If we just went around and asked, what does it mean to be fully devoted? We might come up with different answers. Some things might be the same, some things would be different. And so what we've done is we've identified what we believe are five core characteristics. As followers of Jesus, these are five core areas, five fundamental things we believe that we all need to be growing in as followers of Jesus. And that is why we're fully devoted to these five things. Last week, we talked about being fully devoted to God's word. God's word is his revelation of himself to us. This is how we get to know God. And we're fully devoted to his word, to study it, to read it, to preach it, to base our lives on it. We believe it to be inspired by God. And so we have a high value of the authority of scripture. The second is this, that we're fully devoted to prayer. Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is fundamental for us. The foundation of every Christian endeavor is prayer. Jesus was the word made flesh. Jesus lived on this earth and Jesus spent time praying. I mean, if there was ever a person that lived that could maybe go through life and not pray, you think it would maybe be Jesus. But Jesus spent so much time in prayer, his followers saw this about him and they said, Jesus, man, teach us how to pray. Like, I mean, we grow up learning prayers. These were Jewish men who had grown up learning the Torah and learning the prayers and learning how to pray the Psalms and they they knew prayers, but there was something different about the way Jesus prayed. They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus once said, a a student is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. In other words, if it was necessary for Jesus to pray, how much more necessary is it for us to pray, to spend time in prayer? Prayer is communication with God. Prayer is easy to do, but prayer is also easy not to do. But think about this. We have an opportunity. We actually can talk to God. That's what prayer is. You know, I've lived in in Jacksonville a long time, but I've never met the mayor. I've been in the state of Florida for a long time, but I can't just ring up and go have an appointment with the governor. I've been a citizen of the United States my whole life, but I can't just ring up and go sit down with the president of the United States. But I can talk to the creator of the universe on a daily basis. That's amazing right? We actually can talk to God. We can communicate with God. And communication is talking and listening. And God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us through our own experiences. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit within us. God speaks to us. That's what prayer is. It's communication. But like I said, prayer is easy to do and is also easy not to do. To just get busy, distracted, or for whatever reason, avoid it. We're gonna take a few minutes and pray for our nation. Before we do, I just wanted to go through a few other thoughts just to really lay this foundation on why prayer is so important. I want you to grow in your desire for prayer, your love for prayer, your commitment to prayer. Sometimes it's a discipline. Leonard Ravenhill, I have a lot of books on prayer, by the way. A lot of books, read about prayer, people who, great revivals, prayer books. I love prayer books and I love books about prayer. And one time I was reading a couple of books about prayer and it occurred to me, reading books about prayer 
is not the same thing as actually praying. Huh. It's kind of like this. If you had a, if you had a manual to a, a brand new Tesla and you're reading that manual, man, it's so good. And I get together with other Tesla owners and we read the manual together and we highlight our favorite parts. But we never actually get in the Tesla and drive it. We've kind of missed the point. And so even reading books about prayer or talking about prayer or listening to a sermon about prayer is not the same thing as actually taking time to pray. It's the foundation of every Christian endeavor. Leonard Ravenhill, in his book, Why Revival Tarries, he wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries. Christians talk about revival. They want revival. Well, why, why does it not happen? His contention is perhaps not enough praying. He says, prayer is not an argument with God to persuade him to move things our way, but an exercise by which we, we are enabled by his spirit to move ourselves his way. That's great. He said this, notice we never pray for people we gossip about and we never gossip about people we pray for. Prayer is a good deterrent. Honestly, this is one of the reasons we pray for other churches. We want God to bless them, but it also gives direction to our own hearts so that we don't enter into critical or gossip conversations about other churches. We pray for them. He said, many people study because their brain is hungry, even for Bible knowledge. But we pray because our souls are hungry for God. William Carey, a great missionary, he said, prayer, secret, fervent, believing prayer lies at the root of all personal godliness. Richard Foster, the author of Celebration of Discipline and an entire movement of spiritual disciplines, he said, prayer catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. It ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. I'm trying to stir your desire for prayer. One other quote I want to share with you from Leonard Ravenhill, and it's a little more convicting. He was, he was quite direct. He says this, the prayer chamber is a mirror reflecting our spiritual condition. Is this why the prayer chamber is so unpopular? Do we fear self-exposure, exposure of ourselves to ourselves? Are we afraid of discovering spiritual deformity within us? The prayer chamber is a place to check up on spiritual health. Such a convicting quote. Why do we so many times avoid prayer when it's so easy? to just actually pray. Maybe it is exactly like he says. We don't want to be confronted with something, and so we avoid it. Ian Bounds, in his book, uh, he wrote a lot of books on prayer. Uh, in fact, Samuel has a whole collection. It's like this thick of books on Ian Bounds wrote on prayer. This one is just a little booklet uh, called The Weapon of Prayer. And he says, God works through the prayers of his people. God works through the prayers of his people. And when we fail him at this point, decline and deadness ensue. He later says that not to pray. We acknowledge God. We say God is real. We come to church. We say we believe in God. But he says not to pray is actually a denial of God, a denial of his existence, a denial of his nature, a denial of his purposes toward God humanity. So if we say we believe and then we don't actually pray, he says that's tantamount to denying God's existence altogether. This week, I was um, at Trinity Fitness, and one of the trainers, a guy named Mike Coy, uh, was sharing the devotion before the workout, and he, he was sharing about how uh, their son is away at camp. And they're a very close family. Their kids haven't been away from them that much. And so there's a little bit of family anxiety about you know, their son going away to camp. And here he is away at camp. And they pull up on the computer because they can watch some of the sessions. 
You know how sometimes that happens if your kids have gone to camp, you can get online and watch. And he says, there they are online, the whole family is around watching and they see their son at camp and they want so bad they missed him. They're not allowed to talk to him all week. They take the phones away and all this. And so they want so bad to talk to him and they can't, but they can see what he's doing and they have so much affection and feeling he has no idea and they can't communicate. And here's what he shared. It occurs to him, he said, I wonder how many times God might feel that way about us. Like he's looking, he sees us, he wants so bad to have that connection and and we just don't talk to him. Prayer is communication with God. It's important that we take time, spend time in prayer. Right now, our nation is reeling from events of this past week and certainly yesterday. And I want us to take some time and pray for our nation. We, we acknowledge and, and grieve and pray for the families of those that were lost, pray for those that were injured for their recovery. And we also thank God for protection, that it wasn't worse. Today would be much different. It would be a much different feeling if it had just been centimeters. And we thank God for that. But we have a lot to pray for. Because our appropriate response is not fear, not political rhetoric, is to pray. It's to pray for our nation to have an encounter with God. And I want us to do that right now. I want us to take some time as a church and pray together. There is power in the prayer of agreement. This isn't just you listening to me pray and critiquing whatever words might or might not be said, but it's a time for us to join our faith together and pray. So I'm gonna lead you and I'll end each prayer just by saying, Lord, in your mercy, and then you're gonna respond together by all saying, hear our prayer out loud together. Let's practice that. Lord, in your mercy. Pray that and mean it. Join me in faith and let's pray for our nation. Let's bow our hearts together. Heavenly Father, giver of life, we entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of our cherished rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Reclaim this land for your glory and dwell among your people. Lord, in your mercy, Oh, Lord, govern and bless the leaders of our land that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations on the earth. Lord, in your mercy. To the president and members of the cabinet, to governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority, grant wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties. Lord, in your mercy, to senators and representatives, to those who make our laws and states and cities and towns, give courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people and to fulfill our obligations in the community of nations. Lord, in your mercy, to the judges and officers of our courts, give understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, teach our people to rely on your strength, to accept their responsibility to their fellow citizens, that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of our society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, thank you. And I wanna encourage you, as you hear news, as things get posted, let's continue to pray for our nation to have an encounter with the living God. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of scripture? We're looking today at Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. 
So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on, upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God, and all who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Psalm 63 is a beautiful expression of longing and trust in God written by King David. All of the Psalms are actually prayers. When we talk about being fully devoted to prayer, all the Psalms are prayers. They're prayers and praises. I mean, it's been a tradition for Christians and denominations for thousands of years to literally just pray the Psalms. It's featured in many prayer books just as an actual prayer. The Psalms are prayers and they are prayers that arise from consideration of what God has done in the past, of what he will do in the future, and the need for God in the immediate present with a recognition of his sovereignty and goodness. They are poetic expressions of prayers of repentance, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers which contain messianic prophecy, prayers which reflect on his return. This is what the book of Psalms is. And so it's a great guide for us uh, to pray. This psalm was born in the wilderness of Judah, of Judah, a dry and desolate place. Was, it serves as a powerful backdrop for David's yearning for God's presence. This is where David fled from Saul and from Absalom. It's where during Yom Kippur, the scapegoat is released into the wilderness to die of thirst. It's where Jesus went when he fasted and prayed. This is the backdrop to the psalm. As we explore this psalm, I want us to reflect on our own spiritual thirst and the profound satisfaction that we can find in God alone. David says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. What is the thirstiest you've ever been? Can you remember being really, really thirsty? And you just, you needed something. You didn't even care what. You just wanted something to drink. Or maybe, maybe you think of these movie scenes where somebody's out in the desert and they're so thirsty, they've been dry, riding on the camel and the camel finally so thirsty, it dies, which is not possible for you to outlive a camel, but in the movies it happens. And then the guy, he's crawling through the, you know, through the sand and he sees, he sees water ahead. And suddenly, you know, you're looking, he's crawling past the scorpion and his, his lips are cracked and his skin is parched and he sees the water and he gets suddenly this burst of energy and he jumps up and he runs to the water and he dives in it and he starts swimming around in it only to realize it's a mirage and he's actually just still in the sand. You ever seen those kind of movies? That's thirsty. And David is saying, that's how I feel, like that kind of thirst. He begins with this heartfelt cry to God my soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. In this opening verse, it's a vivid depiction of David's intense desire for God. In our busy, often chaotic lives, we too experience moments of spiritual dryness or even seasons of spiritual dryness. Maybe you're in a season like that right now where it seems like, it feels like God is distant and things are dry. David's example teaches us to earnestly seek God and to recognize our deep need for his presence in our lives, even when we feel dry. So here is what I'm trying to say. When you feel dry spiritually and you feel distant from God, pray. Cry out to God. Tell God how you feel. It's not just about praying when I feel really good. You know, and I feel really spiritual and I feel close to God and everything is going good in my life. Now I can really pray. See, that's, that's an immature response. That's me being controlled by my emotions. Emotions and feelings are important, 
But feelings are, feelings are great servants, but they're bad, they're terrible masters. They can indicate something that we should pay attention to, but they're terrible masters because they'll mislead us. And you know, when, I, when I talk to young people sometimes, and we, we talk a little bit about this, about what it means to be mature versus immature, and when you first come to faith, right, you first realize, you get this revelation that God is real, that he loves you, and that your sins are forgiven. And that's an incredible liberating moment when you have this encounter with God and something inside of you is lit and it, you, you become alive and you're so excited. You can't wait to read the Bible. You can't wait to pray. You can't wait to go to church. You don't even care what the song is. You just wanna be in his presence with other people. That's how it is when you're right here and you first come to faith. It's awesome. But then all of a sudden you enter into a season at some point when it's very dry. It could be a year, it could be two years, it could be seven years. But you get into a season in your life, maybe because of circumstances or maybe for no reason at all, it just seems like things are dry. And you're like, you read the Bible and you're like, I've read that verse before. It's just dry. I've heard that sermon before. I've heard a guy preach on this. I wonder if he's gonna do as good a job as the other guy. I've heard that song before. If that worship leader sings that song one more time, not only am I not gonna worship, something bad might happen. See, we get down here and that's a reaction. And so what happens is when we feel like that, this is where people bail. This is where people quit going to church. They quit praying, they quit reading the Bible, whatever it might be, just quit because we don't feel it. Well, I don't feel it. And I've heard people actually use this as an excuse. God knows my heart. And if I'm praying and I don't feel like it, then I'm just a hypocrite. And I'm not gonna be a hypocrite, so I'm not gonna pray. That sounds kind of right on one level, right? Yeah, God already, God knows I don't wanna go to church. So if I go to church and I don't wanna be there, then I'm just being a hypocrite. And I'm not gonna be a hypocrite. I'm gonna stay home instead. Watch NFL. That's an immature response. Mature response is, I don't feel like praying, but I'm gonna pray anyway. I don't feel like getting up and going to church today, but I'm going to go anyway. See, that is a mature response. It's not being led by your emotions. Instead, you lead your emotions. And then sometimes, not always, as you do that, the feelings come. I don't feel like praying, but I'm gonna get up and pray anyway. So I start this, God, I come before you right now, Lord, I acknowledge that you are God. I'm not even feeling it. My heart's not in it, but I'm doing what I know to do. God, I acknowledge that you are God. I acknowledge that you are the one that is in control of my life. You are sovereign over all things. I come to you right now, God, and I, I, sur I submit my life to you. God, I pray that you would have your way in my life, even today. God, let me see your hand moving in my life today. Let me be aware of where you're speaking to me today. And all of a sudden, my emotions begin to change because I was obedient to do it, even though I didn't feel like it. But even if that doesn't happen, it's still the thing to do for my own maturity and growth. So oftentimes though, when you do that, you press through this moment and then you get back to this. But now this is even better because you've weathered some storms. Now you've been through some stuff and there's a depth to it. It's not just about how you feel. And then when I get to this point next time, it doesn't freak me out. I've been spiritually dry before. I know how to get through this. How? By what God told the church to do in Revelations. Do the things you did at first. Continue to do the things you did at first. And then you move right through this. In a dry and weary land where there is no water. When you feel dry, pray anyway. David continues, so I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Even in the wilderness, even in the dry season, David recalls times that he encountered God's presence in the sanctuary. He remembers God's power and glory and this memory fuels his worship and praise. You see this throughout the Psalms as a time of, of looking back and remembering what God did, where they saw God's faithfulness, where David or one of the other psalmists encountered God. You see this throughout the Old Testament. They would build altars to remember God's faithfulness so that the next time they got in a terrible situation, they could look back and go, the God who took us through that, he'll get us through this. 
It builds our faith. And that's what you see happening in the Psalms. In the early service before church, Julie McKay uh, came up and spoke to me. And you guys might remember, we prayed for her and Mark a couple of weeks ago. They're gonna be going with Samaritan's Purse and into a very rural area in Kenya and spending about six weeks over there uh, up near the north where there's a lot of refugees from the Sudan. And uh, she came to me before the early service and she said that God had put it on her heart a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this to begin writing her own Psalms. So she's writing her own Psalms just for her. And what she's doing is she's writing in the Psalms the times that she remembered God did something in her life the times that God was very real to her, the times that she encountered the Lord. She's writing her own Psalms. I think that's a great exercise to remember God's faithfulness because when we forget to focus on God's faithfulness, we begin to doubt and we begin to get insecure spiritually. We have to remember God's faithfulness continues through all generations. You know, we have ways of doing this for our families. We have scrapbooks, um, Many of you know Jeff and Lori Yee. And uh, are they here today by any chance? Okay, uh, well, I, didn't, I don't even know why the story popped into my head. Uh, but Jeff and Lori Yee, Laura has really documented their family very well. If you've ever been to any gathering or been to their house, you see loads of pictures of all the family activities. And uh, she's just been so good about doing that. And this is what we do as a family. We create scrapbooks. We create these moments where we can remember our family, birthdays, holidays, vacations, things like that. They're important to us to remember. Even, even Facebook does this. It pops up your memory 10 years ago. Y'all ever have that happen? Sometimes I'm not glad about it. It like pops up and I go, oh yeah, I used to have hair. Thanks, Facebook. But, but the point is, we need to be intentional about remembering God's faithfulness and recalling the ways we encountered God like David is doing here. I remember, I feel dry right now, but God, I remember when I encountered you in the sanctuary. I remember when you spoke to me. I remember when you made yourself so real to me, even as a kid. I remember certain moments in my life when I knew that God was present with me. And those things then begin to build my faith to move forward through the circumstance I might currently be in to get me through that dry season. When we find ourselves in spiritual deserts, it's crucial to remember God's faithfulness in the times we experience his presence. Reflecting on his goodness and steadfast love can transform a dry season into an opportunity for deeper worship and intimacy with God. When you feel dry and you feel alone, pray. And just out loud, Begin to recount the ways you remember God moved in your life, even if it feels like it was so long ago, even if it feels like something of the past. Remember his faithfulness. David declares, my soul will be satisfied as with, the fat, and with, with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. That's important because this is usually where anxiety and fear kick in. Late at night, when you finally get quiet and you, sit, you lay down to go to sleep, and you think you're so tired, and as soon as you lay down, all of a sudden your mind kicks on again, and the anxiety is there. And David says, in those moments, in those moments, I'm going to meditate on you. I'm going to remember you and meditate on you, for you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. My, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. David's meditations on God's faithfulness bring him joy and comfort, even in the darkest hours of the night. And he experienced some dark hours. Have you ever craved for something? You really wanted something? You, you, you know, you had a crave. <laughs> Lydia is, my daughter uh, is pregnant. And, uh, you know, pregnant women get cravings. Y'all ever notice that? It happens. I've witnessed it a few times in women in my life. And those cravings be so powerful. But, you know, all of us have cravings, a desire for something. And uh, this week at um, Trinity Fitness, another person that was given a devotion was Graydon. He's on the camera right there. He's waving. <laughs> uh, Graydon was leading the devotion, and they had been out of the country in Dominican Republic and uh, Graydon said one of the things they were talking about before they came back is, what are you looking forward to when you go home? And I won't share everything he shared there with a bunch of guys. Uh, but one of the things he was looking forward to that he was craving himself 
was a McChicken. And I think Graydon needs to get a little more culture. <laughs> but whatever, we all have our own cravings, right? Who am I to judge? I like coffee, so there you go. So he was really craving a McChicken. He just couldn't wait to get back and go get that McChicken. You ever had a craving, you know? And, but listen, all the cravings we have in this life will leave us unsatisfied. They won't satisfy permanently or long-term. C.S. Lewis says there's a reason for that. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. All these things reveal to us that instead of getting frustrated that nothing can really satisfy my soul in this world, is to recognize, well, wait a minute, it's because that's meant, it's not meant to satisfy me. It's meant to actually reveal to me that I'm made for something else to lead me to the Lord. And then when I actually find my satisfaction in the Lord, then I can actually enjoy those things. Then I can be at peace with the circumstances. In our lives, it is through prayer that we can find the same satisfaction by meditating on God's word, by recalling his past faithfulness, by trusting his promises. When we cling to God and allow his right hand to uphold us, we can experience a deep and lasting joy that transcends circumstances. A.W. Tozer said it this way, the man who has God for his treasure has all things in one. David concludes, those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God and all who swear by him shall exult for the mouth of the liars will be stopped. In the face of adversity and in the face of his enemies, David places his trust in God's righteous judgment. He knows that God will ultimately bring justice and vindication to those who trust him. This assurance allows, Davis to rejoice, allows David to rejoice in God, even in the trials. See, many times we want to take control. We want to be the, we want to be the ones to bring justice. We want to defend ourselves a certain way. And that's the wrong response for us to try to take it into our own hands or blast somebody. And I've, I've counseled people against this at times, people that find themselves in, in a crisis and they want to go on the offense and they want to tear up everything. And that's not the way to do it. Even King David, he's recognized this and he had, he had witnessed this. He had seen it. Read 1 Samuel chapter 23 and 24. David is fleeing from Saul, who is actually wrong. Saul has lost his mind. Saul is trying to kill David. For no reason. He's trying to kill David. David flees. Saul pursues. David takes refuge with his men in a cave. And while they're hiding in this cave, Saul, the king, comes into the cave, as the Bible says, to relieve himself. And when this happens, David's men say, look at this. God is putting him in your hands right now. Go, take justice into your own hands. Go, take him out. God's providing you this opportunity. Go do it. David says, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna touch the Lord's anointed. That's not for me. That's God, God's the one to bring justice. But what David does do is he goes and he cuts off part of the king's robe. And as soon as he does it, his heart is convicted inside of him. He, he knows that what he did was wrong. And then when Saul goes out of the cave, David comes out after him and he, to come out and repent. And he's carrying the piece of material that he'd cut off. And he says, I could have killed you, but I didn't. But even now he felt bad for what he did do. And there's this moment of reconciliation that happens. David recognizes we have to trust God to bring justice. We too can trust God's justice and sovereignty. When we face challenges and oppositions, we can rest in the knowledge that God sees and God will act on our behalf. This trust enables us to rejoice in God, confident that he will uphold us and bring justice in his perfect timing. I think that is 
especially relevant to us right now in our nation. We need to place our trust in God's sovereignty and his justice. What our nation needs is an encounter with the living God. Let's be careful to not give in to fear or political rhetoric or to try to make something happen in our own will. Psalm 20 says, some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. In other words, some trust in the strength of this world, but not us. We trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Jesus said in John 14, you know, he's telling them, look, in this life, you're gonna have trouble. It's gonna be tough. He says, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. There'll be troubles around you, but don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Placing our trust in him is this beginning, it's the first prayer. It's yielding and surrendering to placing our trust in him. Psalm 63 invites us to cultivate a deeper longing for God, to remember his faithfulness, to find satisfaction in his presence and to trust his judgment. As we journey through our own spiritual deserts, let's follow David's example of seeking God earnestly, praising him joyfully and trusting him completely. May we like David, declare with confidence, God, you are my God. Would you stand with me this morning? And we're going to actually do that right now. I want to lead us in a prayer of confession, confessing that we've all sinned and confessing Jesus as our savior, a a prayer of placing our trust in him, And then after we pray this, we want to respond to this moment exactly the way David here at the beginning of the psalm does. He's, God, you're my God. Earnestly, I seek you. We're going to go into a song and just have a moment. I don't want to rush the moment. I want you to enter into that moment and make this personal and real between you and God, whatever season you're in. And if you're in a dry season, this is the way through it. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Go ahead and bow your heart for the Lord. I'll give you the words, but you pray this and you make it your prayer. And then we're going to worship together and respond to God's word. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your son, my savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth. You died for my sin. You rose and now live. I receive you as my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. Amen. If you were encouraged by today's sermon, be sure to hit subscribe wherever you stream your podcasts. To experience other sermons, live services, and additional resources, visit us online at RedeemerPV.com.